Tonight, we're investigating sham marriages. We penetrate the criminal gangs making millions of pounds who, we are told, are trading in human beings. This is Julia. As new laws to tackle sham marriages are introduced, we're inside one of Britain's busiest register offices. I've had a call to say that immigration offices are in our car park. So I go down the back way, obviously, and spoil the end of surprise. But despite the promised government crackdown, filming undercover, we reveal an illegal industry operating with utter contempt for the authorities. What we're doing right now is against law. I know that. And we confront the racketeers. I just want to ask you how long you've been setting up fake marriages for money for. You know blackmail's illegal, don't you? All of it is criminal, and it demonstrates uh, how big a scale of the problem we, we face. As Britain takes an increasingly hardline approach to immigration, there remains one massive loophole, marriage. Many who wish to remain in the UK are paying thousands of pounds for fake brides and grooms to get a British passport. It's been going on for years, but in an effort to stamp out sham marriages, in March this year, the government introduced strict new rules. So we're setting out to investigate whether this crackdown will work or whether it's just business as usual for the racketeers. We begin our investigation here in one of the busiest register offices in the country, Brent in West London. We start our filming in February, a month before the new laws are due to come into effect. Service operational manager Mandy Brammer and senior registrar Nisha Turnbull have been taking notices of marriage. Nisha has just interviewed a same-sex couple. Increasingly, it seems people are using same-sex marriage, confident that registrars will not want to be accused of homophobia but Nisha and Mandy are suspicious. You've raised a section 24. What was the section 24 on, on the notice there? No interact, uh, with, you know, between the two of them at all. It just didn't look like they were together. And he kept an elbow in him, and I'm thinking, why are you doing that? They just look very suspicious to me. Before any couple can get legally married, in most cases, they must give notice at a register office. This is often the only chance to spot a sham marriage. The registrars have just one short interview with each couple. They have no power to stop a marriage, but if they believe a couple isn't genuine, by law, they're meant to submit a Section 24 report to the Home Office. But their job is getting more difficult. It becomes harder and harder to detect. It's much more sophisticated now. Before, you knew outright if you had an interpreter for one and an interpreter for the other, then how do they communicate? You'd get the age old, we don't need English or words to communicate. Love it, love. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the language of love, absolutely. It's now just one week until the yeah. law change. The same sex couple returns to the registrar office for their wedding. Registrar Anna is keeping tabs on them. As a result of Nisha's report, an immigration enforcement team is coming to intercept the couple before the ceremony. Are you the groom? Where's your partner? Is he coming? Have you got witnesses? It's OK, you're still early. It's essential the couple don't know the officers are waiting for them. I've had a call to say that uh, the immigration officers are in our car park. So I go down the back way, obviously, to spoil the element of surprise. It's a lot of steps, <laughs> it's a lot of steps. There's four people downstairs, so... The two, two there, there, there. and the two. Because so. one of them's pacing up and down a lot. I know he was very nervous. I'm going to go and get the. Um... That's, the that's one of the grooms, a nervous one. Yeah. He's on the I know he is, yeah. Okay. I'm going to bring them up. 
thing I hate. You need to come with me for an interview, please. Anna brings the unsuspecting couple upstairs. They're taken to separate rooms and immigration enforcement start what could be hours of interrogation. Two hours later and Anna has just received word the immigration officers have finished the interviews. The immigration boys have just taken both, both. away. They've both been arrested. OK. So that's not going ahead today. Registrars in this office hope the new laws will stop these disruptive raids. From now on, everyone, no matter what their status, will have to wait a month between giving notice and getting married. Anyone without a European passport or permanent residency in the UK will also be referred automatically to the Home Office and could face an investigation of up to 70 days. This should mean that fake couples are stopped well before their wedding day. Today I had to ask the um, UK Border Police to close the blinds every time I went past. You know, the, he was just staring at me because he knew I did the paperwork. We're just doing our job, Ish. We are. According to the Home Office's own figures, up to 10,000 sham weddings could be happening each year. But we're told this could be a gross underestimate. So we're going to start our own investigation to find out just how easy it is to arrange a sham marriage and to see for ourselves if the tough new laws are really going to work. We start by looking online. We find adverts for marriage bureaus and dating agencies. One sticks out. It says it can help fix up marriages for people on student visas. We also find adverts placed by people looking to marry so they can stay in the UK. We put up our own advert for a Pakistani called Ali, in fact, our undercover reporter. Almost at once, we get an unsigned email from someone offering a British girl willing to marry for money. So Ali decides to make contact. He's going to pose as a foreign student from Pakistan, desperate to find a way to stay in Britain before his visa runs out. Almost immediately, we got a response. Who was it and what did they have to say? Well, there was this um, person who introduced himself as Chris. I have a recording of the call. The offer is to get you married. But obviously, you, you have to understand, yeah, this marriage is not a long-term thing. Yeah. This person is just helping you get your visa. Money-wise, to be honest with you, yeah, I'm not trying to rip you off, but you have to be realistic. Like, the minimum that you'd be expecting to pay for this would be, have to be about £2,000, mate. Meanwhile, Ali has also come across an outfit that describes itself as a marriage bureau. But what kind of marriage exactly? The woman in charge introduces herself as Amber. OK, what I can do for you, I can find a girl for you if you're interested in marriage. My fee is going to be around uh, 800. Then you tell me what you want to exactly to do. You want to go ahead with a girl for a paper marriage or you want to live with her for the rest of your life. Thank you. Bye-bye. What struck me, uh, quite strongly from our experience so far is that despite what you read, the law is being changed quite dramatically in a way to try and stop these things from happening. Actually, we found two different methods, two different sets of people with no fear for the law. Absolutely, yeah, um, you're right. Taking part in or organising a sham marriage is illegal. But despite this and the impending government crackdown, for the two fixers Ali has contacted, it seems to be business as usual. A week before the law is due to change, Ali is going to Northampton to meet Chris, the emailer who says he's got a British girl lined up to enter a fake marriage. He's been asked to bring £200 in cash as a deposit. He's been instructed to wait outside the train station. Suddenly, a man appears. Yeah. How are you doing? How's it going? Chris. Chris. Ali, is he sure if you was coming today or not? But the girl is actually in town, because I thought you might want to meet us today. Chris introduces Ali to Sarah, the fake bride. She's got two young children with her. Chris boasts that he's done this before. Obviously, the first time I was more nervous. About it. This time, I sort of know 
Chris tells Ali he'll have to pay £2,000, which he will split with Sarah. Chris tells Ali it'll be easy and risk-free. He's got a cover story the couple can use to fool the authorities. The story is day inside. Day inside, day inside. That's the same story. That's what uh, everyone's doing these days. Uh, young people are uh, find someone, meet someone. <laughs> I take Ali's undercover footage to Nazir Afsal, an eminent lawyer. He's spent 12 years as a director and later a chief prosecutor for the Crown Prosecution Service. That's just a completely utter fabrication of a marriage. He clearly is not your organised Mr Big. However, uh, he has access to people. Uh, he knows the people that are desperate for a visa, whatever it may be. He brings them together. Ultimately, he'll make money out of it. All of it's criminal. Just two days after the trip to Northampton, Ali's in West London on his way to meet the second sham marriage outfit, Amber, the woman from the so-called marriage bureau. I'm standing right in front of the station. She tells Ali to wait outside a tube station. Amber pulls up in a white Mercedes and hurriedly asks Ali to get inside. Hello. There's a man with her who she introduces as her husband, Akbar. They start speaking in Urdu. As soon as Ali's phone is switched off, the couple immediately get down to business. They say they've got a girl for him and she's got a British passport. They tell Ali the girl is unemployed. Any British citizen marrying a foreign national should be earning over £18,000 for their spouse to get residency in the UK after their wedding. But that's nothing to worry about, they say, because they have an accountant who will forge payslips and tax returns. If documents according to their requirements, hmm. then the visa ka refusal will not be able to Sitting in their big white Merc, Amber and Akbar coach Ali in the other tricks they use to fool the authorities. Ali coughs up a £300 registration fee and they drop him back at the tube station. In the space of just 72 hours, he's been offered two fake brides. Nazir Afsal has dealt with numerous cases involving sham marriages and criminal gangs. This couple, he says, look like big players. Some of money involved, you know, £10,000 or thereabouts. We're talking about millions of pounds being made by people like her and others um, based on a, a practice which is criminal. There's no uh, two ways about it. It's now early March and a new law has just come into force. It automatically refers anyone without a European passport or British residency to the Home Office, who now have 70 days to investigate suspicious couples. But will it make any difference to the racketeers? Our undercover reporter, Ali, is returning to Northampton for his second meeting with Chris. So this is going to be in the Northampton? Northampton, yeah. Is your office? The marriage part. There's a simplest process of this. The like, actual marriage part is the simplest process of this. If there's anything dodgy, if they think oh, something's dodgy, then it might be 70 days before you officially are married. Two months or so. And what, is, what sort of investigations do they do? Just background checks, really. All right. So then how are we going to make sure that our background is legit? That's where we're here today. Yeah. The story is basically keep it very, very, very simple, guys. 
Over the next hour, Chris guides Ali and his bride-to-be, Sarah, through their cover story. He tells Ali that despite being from different backgrounds, he's confident that they won't be asked any tricky questions. The thing is that she's British, I'm Pakistani. <clears throat> and to, on the face of it, it, you know, it seems like a relationship that, that stands out. I see where you're coming from. As far as, as far as ethnicity, religion, that is very, it's so touchy, they are scared to bring it up. It's not PC, it's not something they bring up. The fear of being called racist. Chris says once Ali is married, he cannot be forced to leave the UK. He boasts about his excellent track record. Marriage went straight through, like, mm -hmm. no problems in terms of getting referred to home office. I'm not a crime boss. As far as I see, it's a team effort. Oh. Like, everyone gets something out of it. Yeah. After agreeing their cover story, Chris takes the couple into the pub garden to take some photographs. Oh, don't cry. How am I meant to make this look real? All right. I don't know. Get pissed. Go on, kids, get pissed. I think you should both look at the camera and smile, at the least. Yeah, yeah. Go on. Yeah? Ready? Chris says they don't look relaxed enough. I, I could park, I could, I could build a house there. Man. You can take yourself selfie, that one of you can take yourself. I know how to work in that. But I thought, like, I don't know, kiss me on the cheek or something. Everyone's happy. But suddenly, yeah. Sarah seems to be getting anxious. Good. I just don't want to get in trouble. But Chris really starts explaining stop. why they have nothing to worry about, but someone else walks past. I'll be careful. Shh, shh. Sarah's right to be worried. If she and Ali are caught attempting to go through with a sham marriage, they could both face criminal charges for perjury and breaching immigration law. Chris tries to calm her. In terms of trouble, right? you, you can get your marriage rejected. That's as much as trouble you get. Listen, if, if she was Polish, yeah, that'd be a lot more suspicious and dodgy. But she's British, like, you will not get in trouble. What we're doing right now is against the law. I know that. Chris says he'll book an appointment for Sarah and Ali at the Northampton Registry Office to give their notice of marriage. He says he'll be in touch again in a week. It's not PC, it's not something they bring up. He's right, I suspect, about questions wouldn't be asked. People these days are less likely uh, to ask those kinds of questions um, because they don't want to be accused of being racist or religiously discriminatory. The saddest thing is we, the British taxpayer, the public, lose out, and that can't be right. I'd never imagined that it was happening in Northampton. So if it's happening in the East Midlands, where isn't it happening? A few days after the meeting in the pub, Chris demands Ali pay more money up front if he wants the deal to go through. Ali returns to Northampton. This time, Chris turns up on his own. Sarah's not there. He says she's still on board, and despite the new rules, he's confident they'll get their application waved through and will be able to marry in about four weeks' time. Because that's the only thing that has changed. Mm. Is, uh, the only thing that has changed is a uh, timeline. They can't stop the two people from legally getting married. They can't say so with the law change, it's only just the time period. Yeah. And there you go. So he, that's just the conclusion yeah. there. It's just a time period, it's nothing else. That's the perception, and the perception has to change with some real robust action. But that's going to take a long, long time, Ranvir, because, you know, we've had years and years of, of lax controls, uh, which have enabled people to breach them uh, almost, you know, on a daily basis. Some people might say, is sham marriage that big a problem when we've got other things to deal with, uh, you know, limited resources? It's a massive problem because the moment that you uh, are able to go through a marriage ceremony, you access everything this country has to offer, whether it's benefits, our free health service, our free education system. Ali returns to Northampton for a fourth time. He's expecting to meet Chris and Sarah again to rehearse their cover story. But there's no one there. 
instead he gets a text message. It says it's from Sarah and that someone she knows has found out about the sham marriage. The conversation takes a new turn. It seems that Ali's being blackmailed. On his way back to London, Ali starts getting a series of threatening emails. Suddenly, he gets a PayPal demand for £200. The messages say Ali has until the next day to pay up or he'll be reported to the police. In the days that follow, he gets an increasingly desperate stream of messages from Chris. Then it goes quiet and the messages stop. We send one final email and suddenly we get a reply. Chris says he will meet. He says Ali will have to hand over the blackmail money. He asks Ali to meet him outside a train station. But this time, we're following right behind. Hi, Chris. Um, I'm Ranveer Singh from ITV Exposure. I just want to ask you how long you've been setting up fake marriages for money for. I haven't been saying Yeah, you have. You've been asking for £2,000 to set Ali up with uh, Sarah. No, yeah, we've, got, we've been filming you for... About three months, we've seen everything you've been saying to him. Nope. Did Sarah uh, get upset about breaking the law? Is that why you started to blackmail Ali? You know blackmail's illegal, don't you? In response to our allegations, Chris told us... I did not organise or arrange a sham marriage. I did organise meetings with Ali for my personal gain but I was only giving him my personal opinions and did not contact the authorities. The woman identified as Sarah was merely present as a friend, made no money from this and does not share my opinions. We also tried, without success, to contact Sarah. It's early April and the new rules have been in force for a month. In Brent, Head of Registration Services Mark Rimmer and his deputy Mandy Brammer were expecting to see a drop in the number of people coming in to give notice of marriage, particularly as they've been so proactive at reporting couples in the past. In fact, they've been as busy as ever. People aren't being cut off. That's a slight concern if I was in the Home Office. In the last month in Brent, of the 300 notices they've taken, nearly 100 couples have been referred automatically to the Home Office, but it appears only 16 have been checked so far. They're concerned the Home Office doesn't have the resources to investigate this huge number of couples. They would have been looking at hardly any before. Well, you can imagine if it's 99 in one district of London for one month, just over a month, they're going to be looking at, well, many, many thousands a year. Mandy's also discovered that people are finding ever more sophisticated ways to evade the new rules. I'm just reading up on uh, an email that's come through some intel from the Home Office. She's discovered that an Indian man has obtained a fake Belgian passport and is trying to register a marriage with a Romanian woman. This means, as they will appear to be two European nationals, they will not get referred to the Home Office for investigation. People know that a European national is not going to be challenged in the registry office. I don't understand how they think that it's not going to be challenged, though, in the immigration service. People will chance it. They will just chance it. Coming up, Akbar, the marriage bureau boss, boasts to our reporter Ali that he can organise a fake Muslim marriage, the nikah. And these fixes lead Ali even deeper inside their criminal underworld. He's not an ordinary man. We are, we are, a, we are, a, very, we are a very small breakfast family. Very, very small breakfast. Despite tough new rules being introduced, our undercover reporter Ali has already been offered one fake bride in Northampton. He's now on his way to meet the second, offered to him for £10,000 by fixers Amber and Akbar. They pick him up and drive him to a local restaurant. They introduce him to Zahida, his potential fake bride. Akbar boasts of his bureau's track record in the fake marriage industry. 
your success rate. Hundred percent success. They tell Ali his bride Zahida will transfer her bank statements and other posts to his address. The couple go on to explain other ways they will make the relationship look genuine. फिर आपने चैट करना है थोड़ा टाइम टेक्सिंग ये वो आपस में को टाइम हो जो यस ये तो बिजनेस डील अगेन द रीसेंट चेंज इन द लॉ डजंट बॉथर देम एट ऑल उसमें कोई चेंजिंग नहीं आई उसमें टाइम ऑफ पीरियड थोड़ा सा तो इससे इससे क्या फर्क पड़ेगा कुछ भी नहीं पड़ेगा they also say Ali will be able to get out of the marriage just as easily as he's getting into it. Mm -hmm. So once everything's done for registration and everything, does he have to do the will for two years? Yes, minimum. And the care they don't do, the work they take up the marriage. They've been careful to pair Ali with someone from the same religious and ethnic background. One of the increasingly sophisticated ways they're staying one step ahead of the new law. Yeah, risk kill goes away. No risk. No risk. No. This man, the girl, 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 it's seven days later, and Ali is on his way back to Hounslow for his third meeting with Amber and Akbar. They're covering their trail like spies, using a different car and driving him to a different location for each meeting. They boast about another sham marriage they're setting up. The woman involved is an illegal immigrant, a Hindu, so Akbar is fixing her fake wedding in a temple. पहले मंत्र में शादी कराऊंगा लेकिन वो कहती शादी असल नहीं होगी मंत्र नहीं होंगे बस हम तस्वीरें मैं करती तक वो अब वो करेंगे उसका उसे सर्टिफिकेट मिल जाएगा अब वो सर्टिफिकेट मिलेगा जब रजिस्ट्रेशन के लिए जाएंगे ना तो रजिस्ट्रेशन वाले चोर भी नहीं करेंगे इसी तरह अगर मुसलमान हो तो उसका निकाह करा लो मैंने अच्छा हाँ जूठा जूठा निकाह करा लो सर्टिफिकेट ले लो they tell Ali that the temple is being paid £500 to host the sham ceremony. And they go on to boast about another illegal sideline to their business. Like original? Original, recorded. How much is it? About 10,000. Akbar shows Ali two of the fake passports. He says they're all registered at the proper embassies, so can be used for travelling in and out of the UK. But suddenly there's a problem. Ali's told Zahida's insisting she get her first £5,000 before going any further. Ali says he's worried she won't go through with it. Seven days later, Ali is told that Zahida won't go ahead because she hasn't got her first payment of £5,000. So he returns to Hounslow to meet Amber and Akbar. They say they've got a solution. They agree to speak again soon, but not before once again showing how little they care about the government's new crackdown. What you believe? What you What soft? What soft? What soft? So soft, they tell Ali, they arrange as many as four sham marriages every month. If ten thousand pounds is being paid out for each of these weddings. This couple and their associates could be raking in nearly half a million pounds a year.
Across the country, sham marriages could be generating millions for the fixers, lawyers, accountants, and religious institutions. And the true cost to the taxpayer is likely even higher. Ali gets a call from Amber. She's been in touch with the so-called supplier. Ali meets me straight afterwards. This is the phone call that I got from Amber. Amber says Ali can meet the girl, but he will have to pay her hourly rate. 150 per hour. Per hour? It's that word supplier that sends chills uh, down your back because uh, it suggests that it's an item, it's not a person. They're literally selling a woman to you. Absolutely. All this sounds like it's taken an even more sinister turn in that everything you're saying sounds very much like human trafficking. I mean, is that how it felt to you? When she said that you can take her passport, take her documents, and then the girl is yours, hearing them explain exactly how this will all play out was, in fact, quite chilling. Coming up, Ali comes face to face with the supplier. Julie here. I can't get over the, the language they use about the woman as if she's absolutely nothing. It's literally shameless. And we confront the racketeers. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. We're investigating the underground industry where criminals are making millions of pounds setting up sham marriages, forging passports and what appears to be offering human beings for sale. Our undercover reporter, Ali, is off to Hounslow. Seasoned marriage fixers Amber and Akbar meet him at a tube station and take him to a nearby supermarket car park. They tell him about the man they refer to as the supplier of young, fake brides. And the woman from the supplier, Ali's told, appears to have little choice about taking part in this illegal sham marriage. Ali is told he will pay £10,000 to Malik, the supplier for the girl, as well as the fee of £800 to Amber and Akbar. Amber says they will also get money from the supplier as a commission when the deal goes through. Suddenly, the atmosphere changes. Malik is here, and he has a woman in his car. Hello. This is Hello, sir. How are you? Oh, I'm very good. How are you? This is Julie here. His car has no number plates, removed perhaps to ensure they're not caught on the supermarket CCTV. 
Ali is told he will have just a few minutes to talk to her. While they sit in the front of the car, Malik and Akbar stand guard outside. Amber watches from the back so, uh, seat. How old are you? 23. OK, and where, where are you from? Romania. So why did you move to London? You see, come, can you? Mm. <laughs> what is she doing mm. now? We'll let you know. Oh, OK. After just 10 minutes, Malik takes Julie away. We don't know any more about Malik than Amber and Akbar tell Ali, but they claim he's in a different league. Malik Malik is not an ordinary man. We are, we, are a very, we are a very small breakfast for him. Very, very small breakfast. Ali is now deep into the underground world of the criminal gangs that seem to be running rings around the authorities. This couple's attitude to the law, despite the recent changes, is shocking, even more so because their business, according to them, involves a trade in human beings. Nazia Afzal has spent decades tackling forced marriage and the abuse of vulnerable people in his role as a chief prosecutor for the CPS. If Amber's description is correct, he has grave concerns. I can't get over the language they use about the woman as if she's not, absolutely nothing. It's literally shameless. According to her, the woman is a puppet and she is brought in with 10 or 15, 20 people at a time. Um, you know, it's wholesale human trafficking. The criminality goes way beyond just the sham marriage. During our six-month investigation, we found fixers and people apparently trading in human beings. They're making millions of pounds at our expense, and it seems they couldn't care less about the change in the law. But the fixers providing the brides and grooms are only part of the story. Amber and Akbar have told Ali they work with accountants and solicitors who are facilitating sham marriages by forging documents and sending in false applications to the Home Office. If what this couple says is true, these professionals are not only breaching their own strict codes of conduct, they're also breaking the law. So Ali is going to go undercover again to find out just how easy it is to find someone willing to break the rules. His story is that his visa is running out and he wants to stay in the UK. Some tell him, unless he is in a genuine relationship, they can't take him on as a client. But with all too many others, Ali's camera captures a different story. This is MA Consultants in Whitechapel, East London. Ali meets immigration advisor Usman Malik. If I, you know, can manage to convince, say, a European national yeah. to marry me for the just for the reason of the mm -hmm. paperwork, mm -hmm. then would you be able to help me out? Yeah, of course, of course. Brilliant. And then, um, I guess, uh, and then exactly. So, what, what what all will you do? So, you compile the paperwork. And yes. Compile the what paperwork. What about the evidence? Complete the application. Um, the evidence will tell you what you need to do. Okay. Osman Malik says he's happy to take Ali on as a client, though warns that if Ali's caught, he could be deported. Next, Ali visits solicitor Mr Nakvi in Southall, West London. His fees are £1,500. obviously genuine relation, we are just charging yeah. whatever just the services. Yeah, regardless service. regardless of whether the relationship is genuine we, or not. We, 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 we believe in your declaration. Finally, Ali visits Dennings in East London and meets solicitor Zulfika Ali. His fees are a cool £2,000. What if I pay someone to marry me? Mm -hmm. would, would you be able to help me out? Yeah, we could we, be able to do that. Help them with the So have you done this before? Do you have experience? I mean, dealing with this guy, we would do uh, this kind of application. I mean, we, instruct, we act on clients and instruction, not our own. 
We also showed the footage of these meetings to Nazir Afzal. Yes, he's outlined the risks attached, but he hasn't identified um, what he is doing, which is uh, facilitating a crime. For him, it's a question of see no evil, hear no evil. The individual has told them he doesn't want to go through a genuine marriage. See no evil, hear no evil doesn't work. They could be conspiring with that individual to facilitate their immigration or breach of the immigration rules, which is a criminal offence. I mean, we instruct, we act on clients' instruction, not our understanding. There can be no real doubt as to what he is saying to the individual concerned. We're talking potentially criminal behaviour and not just simply uh, breaches of um, disciplinary codes. Mr. Usman Malik told us... I have no recollection of the meeting. And? Must have understood this to be an arranged marriage. Both he and MA consultant said they would... Not knowingly breach immigration law, assist others to do so... Or breach their own... Professional codes of conduct. MA consultants added they... Have suspended Mr. Malik and ordered a full investigation and notified the Office of the Immigration Services Commissioner. Mr. Malik is a junior advisor, not a partner, and his views or advice are not representative of the firm. Mr. Nakvi told us... I made my position clear with your reporter. I did not turn a blind eye to a sham marriage. I have practised as a lawyer since 1993 and have an unblemished record. I come from a culture where arranged marriages are the norm. I was making my position clear and that was that any marriage entered into had to be genuine. We also wrote to Dennings about our undercover evidence. They replied that it... ..did not carry less than 500 volt shocking capacity. They were... ..surprised that an experienced solicitor like Zulfika Ali would conduct such irresponsible representation and advice. And they would investigate, suggesting it should be reported to the regulator. Mr Ali, who now runs his own practice, told us... At very early stage, I guessed that he was undercover. I knew that he was not a real client, but a fake one. I had no intention to take instructions from him or to act on his behalf. I do not take cases where there is no merit in the case or someone instruct me to act against the law. Our investigation has revealed that illegal immigration via the sham marriage industry far from being under control, seems to be booming. Ali's been offered several fake brides and assistance from lawyers and immigration advisers. Meanwhile, Amber and Akbar, the fixes in Hounslow, continue to pursue Ali. They say their supplier needs a deposit to hold the girl. He's waiting for them again at the tube station. Amber and Akbar meet him in a different car and drive him to a cafe. They're in a good mood and can't resist telling him why. They say the girl came from Malik and tell him more about the groom. Ali hands over his deposit of £500 and asks how the rest of the process will work. Amber and Akbar remain on Ali's case and ask him to meet them again. They pick him up in a different car and immediately get down to business. They say that Malik has been in touch. They still think they have nothing to fear, but what they don't know is that we're right behind them. Okay, go now. Okay. 
Hello, I'm from ITV Exposure. I'd like to ask you some questions about setting up illegal Sorry, marriages. Yeah, no, it's OK, Amber and Akbar, we know what you've been doing. We've been filming you for three months and we've seen all the illegal things you've been doing. So I'd like, to, I'd like to ask you some questions Regarding what? about the guilt that you might have about selling no. vulnerable women yeah. into illegal marriages. No, we no. know all about it. No, 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 You're no, denying no. it, are you? What no, do you do for a living then? What's your act? How do you make all the money? Sorry? How do you make all your money then? Uh, buying, selling cars. Really? Yes. And what about the fake passports that we saw in the back of the car rack bar that you showed to Which? Ali? No. What about those? Which Ali? The Ali that you came here to meet today. We've been filming Ali. you for three months, we know exactly what you've been Ali. doing. You've been speaking about a woman called Julie, haven't Julie. you, who you were trying to sell Julie. for £10,000 no. through Mr Malik. No. no. You, know Mr. Malik. you don't know Mr Malik no. at all? No, what is the procedure? How can I help you? What is the problem? Just, I just want to talk to you about no, all the money that you make. I don't, I don't want to talk to you. I'm going to come through the legal process. Whatever you want to do, send me the notice or whatever, I'll come Yeah, and what about um, Zahida? Can I just ask you, do you feel any guilt whatsoever about selling uh, Julie and calling her a puppet. You don't have any guilt about that? You don't feel bad I, about that? I don't know what you're talking about. Julie, we know that you met her I and you made Ali meet her in a car. That. I don't know what you're talking about. We know what you've been doing. In response to our allegations, solicitors representing Amber, Akbar, Zahida and Malik confirmed that none of their clients had given our reporter Ali their real names and that they were all legitimate, hard-working members of society. They said Amber and Akbar, a.k.a. Zainab Humayun and Humayun Ramzan, ran a legitimate marriage bureau until December 2014. Zahida, a.k.a. Shazi Hamad, is a part-time admin staff member. And Mr Malik, a.k.a. Kashif Akhtar, is a team leader in a hire car company. They told us their clients fabricated and exaggerated information to go along with Ali, as they suspected him from the outset of trying to set them up, and they wanted to find out why. It was their intention on obtaining his identity to report his conduct to the police. They said that Zahida had also provided false details to Ali as... She suspected he was trying to set them up. A Home Office spokesperson said... The criminal gangs who try to cheat their way around our immigration laws will not escape justice. The Immigration Act, which became law last year, gives us much stronger powers to identify, disrupt and deter sham marriages. In the last year, we intervened in more than 2,900 suspected sham marriages, double the number from the year before. And since March, when our new powers came into effect, we have made more than 230 arrests and removed 150 people from the UK. Immigration enforcement officers are working closely with registrars to ensure the referral process runs smoothly. The majority of decisions to extend the notice period are now made within a week of the couple giving notice. Registrars are also notified so they know how many cases the Home Office is investigating. We are also providing our evidence to the police. Despite the government's crackdown and the best efforts of registrars up and down the country, our evidence suggests it's business as usual for the racketeers. Can anything be done to truly tackle the sham marriage industry? It can't be just a policing issue. The answer lies in the communities themselves stamping down on this because all of us Everybody from uh, minority backgrounds gets tarred with this brush. Most of them probably get away with it, to be perfectly frank with you. And I think they will continue to do so. Irrespective of whatever legislation any government introduces, whilst there is a, a gain to be got from the marriage, there will always be racketeers willing to try and circumnavigate immigration rules.